So I had the privilege of traveling around the United States. This company happened to have hospitals throughout the United States. So I got to travel to all these places. And I noticed when you get a group of guys together in a conference room or a boardroom or a restaurant, and there's at least one doctor present, just one, eventually you start hearing about everybody's issues and concerns. And I noticed over time is there, was, there were similarities between all of them. So all these middle-aged guys are having the same series of complaints. And I also noticed they got the same answers, because what was my response? Did you talk to your doctor? Because I'm not their doctor, right? So they said, yeah. And I heard a, heard a myriad of responses. And those responses ranged from, what do you expect? No wonder you're tired. You're 60. 70-year-old guy was complaining about issues with erectile dysfunction. His doctor said to him, haven't you had enough? <laughs> no joke, right? So I'm listening to this over a period of time, and one day I was flying home, and I don't know what it was about it, but you guys have all been through the whole airport fiasco, right? So I'm going through these airports, and I'm just kind of not feeling right. I'm just kind of sore and so on. And I said to myself, wait a minute. I'm middle-aged. I've been listening to these folks for a year, and maybe it's time for the doctor to become the patient. So I chatted with my wife, who you just met, who is an expert in bioidentical hormone replacement therapy and has been doing it over, for over 25 years. And I did something that's very atypical for a physician. I went and got blood work drawn. And without going through the details, I'll fast forward a little bit for you. But I ended up getting testosterone replacement therapy. I got hormone pellets. And it has changed my life. And I thought to myself, what a disservice the medical community is doing to us as men by not looking into and checking what could be the root cause of what's wrong with us. And I'm here to tell you, and you'll see this by the end of this afternoon, you don't need to live with this anymore. We don't need to put up with it anymore. Everyone talks about menopause, but no one talks about andropause, which is the medical term for male menopause. So I just wanted to share that, that experience with you from, from my own perspective. And um, now we'll talk a little bit about testosterone. So what is testosterone? Well, we all know it's a principal male hormone. It's secreted actually in the testicles, and it's produced originally from cholesterol. And cholesterol, you'll find, is one of the root molecules for a lot of hormones we have in our body. Its effects are to increase muscle mass, bone density, and bone maturation. And then as, as we get a little older and we start developing, it develops our sex organs, deepening of our voice and hair, hair growth. And you start realizing this if, for those of you that have sons. So all of a sudden, your son's in ninth grade, and everything's, you know, hi. And He's chit-chatting with you, and his voice is high, and it starts to get a little bit deeper. And for me and our youngest son, it actually occurred when he started uh, his third year of high school. I went up to, like, put my arm around him and, like, you know, play with him and choke him, and I went, holy cow, wait a minute. And his arms and his shoulders were like rocks. So I said, are you working out at all? And he said, no, nah, not really, you know, just a little bit of the you know, barbell thing. And I said to my wife, that's testosterone. You can eat like crazy, your metabolism is sky high, and he builds muscle mass simply by doing this, look, picking this up. So that's the benefit of youth and testosterone. So the reason I wanted to share that slide with you is you can run, but you cannot hide. Your testosterone, no matter what you do, is going to drop. If you live long enough, it will keep going. Okay? So, those are numbers, though. That's only half of the equation of what's really going on with patients. I used to tell my surgery residents that I trained, you know, you never oper I've never operated on a CAT scan in my life. Never. I've operated on a patient who had a CAT scan, but I've never operated on a CAT scan. So I'm going to tell you the same thing with testosterone replacement therapy. I've never given testosterone replacement therapy to 250. I've given testosterone replacement therapy to a patient who had symptoms in laboratory studies consistent with having a low testosterone. So what are those symptoms that you have when you have low T? Well, a decrease in your muscle mass, 
increase in your body fat, so that little tire around the middle, it's predominantly visceral fat that you increase. So not necessarily fat around your neck, your, your shirt collars don't get bigger, but visceral fat, the fat around your organs in the middle, which also is in, has an incidence of increased cardiovascular disease. Rectile dysfunction, low libido, tired, fatigue, hair loss, lack of motivation, depression, trouble concentrating. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but does anyone ever, just about, just when they're about to leave the house, just on the way out, and they say, hey, by the way, while I'm gone, can you take out the trash, feed the dog, pick up milk, bread, and uh, wash the car? And by the time they get to wash the car, you don't remember what the first two are. Why? Is it because you're not paying attention? Could be. But it could also be your testosterone levels low and you're actually having a hard time concentrating. So the next time you're accused of not paying attention, and if you haven't gotten your T level checked, blame your testosterone. And mood swings. But here's the interesting thing about these symptoms. The bottom five, what's the commonality of the bottom five? They're all from the shoulders up. So we all think of testosterone deficiency and we think of like an Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of guy or someone taking supplemental testosterone. Or we think of folks that have you know, sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, or not, they, can't, they don't have the performance they had when they were in their 20s or 30s in the bedroom. But half of the symptoms are from here up. And this one's my favorite, depression. So what happens when you go in to see the average primary care doctor and they think you're depressed? First of all, that seven to 12 minutes you're gonna spend with them when they evaluate you. So what do they do? They give you pills, right? And what are the most common antidepressants they give you? There are drugs called, in the drug class, called SSRIs. So those are like the Prozacs and the Paxils and the Lexapros of the world. So you go in, you think you're depressed, they give you a pill for it. Guess what? The side effects of that drug, those, that drug or those drug classes, low libido, erectile dysfunction, you get fat. So they're giving you a prescription for a medication without knowing the root cause of your depression, which is going to increase the symptoms of your low testosterone in the first place. I, I guess the only good news about it is, is you get fatter and don't want to have sex anymore, you don't care um, because of the medication. But really, of all those men that they've given that medication to, I wonder how many have actually had their testosterone levels checked. But those are the symptoms. So how do we, how do we know? We have to check, right? The, the only, there's one way to know. I gave up and I finally went and got my blood drawn. It was the smartest thing I've, one of the smartest things I've done. So what we've done at Burek Center is we've created a special panel of laboratory studies that we do on anyone that's going to come in for testosterone replacement therapy or if there's a question regarding sexual function. And in that laboratory panel, which has really been put together by a team of experts, this isn't something you know, unique to Burek Center, but a lot of evidence-based literature went into this, and this is what we test. We test estradiol. Estradiol is one of the three family members of estrogen. We men have estrogen, Our, the women have testosterone. We just have more testosterone than estrogen, they have more estrogen than testosterone. There's a balance. We, of course, check the testosterone. We check your PSA, your prostatic-specific antigen. Why? Make sure you don't have prostate cancer. What's one of the relative contraindications to testosterone replacement therapy? History of prostate cancer. Then we check these three, these four little guys here. These are your thyroid function tests. So we check those hormones to make sure you're not hypothyroid. So one of the symptoms of low testosterone is fatigue. I can give you testosterone until the cows come home, until you're bench pressing a Buick. But if you're hypothyroid, you're still going to be tired. So we need to make sure that your thyroid isn't part of the culprit. 
all of these hormones act in conjunction or in symphony with one another. And if one is out of tune, just like if you're listening to a performance, if one is out of tune, it's going to throw the others out of whack. So you need to make sure they're all on the same sheet of music. Then we check your CBC, which stands for complete blood count. We want to make sure you're not anemic. What if I find out that I check your hemoglobin and it's really low? Well, you're tired because you're anemic. Why are you anemic? Maybe you have colon cancer, I don't know. But I'm not going to give you testosterone therapy until we figure it out. We need to know where you are. CMP is some electrolytes, vitamin D, and vitamin B12. Now, here's the interesting thing about vitamin D. First of all, vitamin D is a hormone. There's one other vitamin that's also a hormone, and that one's A. But we're not going to care about A today. So vitamin D is a hormone. Let me, let me digress for a second on vitamin D. So during the COVID pandemic, we learned a lot about vitamin D and a lack of vitamin D. So before the pandemic, when you went to see your doctor and you had a vitamin D level drawn, and the normal range was, I'm just going to say, 20 to 80, and your level was 22, your primary care doc was happy. It's normal, maybe you need a little supplement, but you're good to go. Then COVID-19 hit, and we found out that having a low vitamin D level was an independent risk factor for morbidity and mortality of COVID-19. So in and of itself, it was a risk factor. Independent of age, so whether you're young or old, sex, male or female, or race. So if you came to the emergency department and you had COVID and your vitamin D level was in the toilet, the chances of you getting sick or dying were higher than those that had an uh, above average vitamin D level. So that's how important it was. So that teaches us today, if you go see your, your primary care doc and you get your vitamin D level checked and it's 30, they're going to tell you they want it at 60, 50 to 60. That's why. But that also tells you something else. It tells you that what we think is normal might not be exactly what we need, right? Because all these people that were having COVID issues and dying of COVID had a normal vitamin D level, OK? Same with your thyroid function. TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, another hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone also has a wide range of normal. And off the top of my head, it's like 0.8 to 4. So if you're 0.9, you're normal. And if you're 3.9, you're normal. Well, I can tell you, you're going to feel a heck of a lot better if your TSH is closer to the lower number. But everyone's a little different. Some folks feel fine at 1.5. Some folks feel fine at 2.5. Some folks feel fine at 3.5. You need to tailor the treatment to the individual and find out how they're feeling and how they're feeling at what level. So it's not necessarily normal or abnormal when you make a clinical decision on how to treat patients. So then one more ho hormone you want to know about is testosterone. So if a normal testosterone level is 200 to 800, given the labs, and you're at 550 and you have no symptoms, I'm not going to give you testosterone. What am I going to do for you? You already feel pretty good, right? not going to make you feel any necessarily any better. However, if you have half a dozen symptoms and your testosterone level is 400, you might be a good candidate for testosterone replacement therapy. I don't want you normal. Anybody can be normal. I want you to be optimized, to feel your best. So patients with a testosterone level, we see this very frequently, are in the low twos, 220, 250, 275. And you take their testosterone levels and you drive it up to 800, and they feel so much better. Life-changing event. So it's not about what's normal and not what's abnormal. It's about what's optimal. And what's optimal is different for each and every one of us. And it's based on two things, our laboratory data and clinically how you're feeling. So if you're having any of those symptoms and you haven't been checked, Stop. Do what I did. Get your labs drawn. We can help you with that. Stephanie and Tom in the back will help you with that if that's something you want to do. We can send you a lab slip. It's not a big deal. It's one stick in the arm and you're done. If it's normal and you feel great, 
Amen. That's awesome. Congratulations. But now you have a baseline. So you know six months, a year, two years, five years, ten years from now, where you were at a certain age and how you felt. And then you come back and visit with me five years later and say, I don't feel so hot. I'm tired, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'll have a pretty good idea of where you were, where you are now, and what happened between the two, and determine whether or not you need replacement therapy. You know, we don't drive our cars until they're out of gas, right? Kind of, you know, halfway, three quarters, depends. Unless you have kids. They drive them until they're empty and then say, you want to take my car to the store. But you don't drive them until they're empty, right? Don't do the same with your body. Don't wait until you've got 10 out of 10 of the most common symptoms of low testosterone and then decide, you know, I think it's time to get checked. So if you're a candidate for testosterone replacement therapy and all your labs check out, clinically it makes sense to do it and you don't have a reason not to do it, what's going to happen? Well, you probably should have after four weeks, which is when we check your labs, generally speaking, so after you get your initial labs, we start you on testosterone replacement therapy. A month later, you get some more labs. So at the end of four weeks, we find people have boosts in their energy. They have less fog. They're more stable. They're not yelling at people as much. They have um, better libido, less problems with erectile dysfunction. And as a result of the top four, they have more self-esteem and feel more confident. Makes sense. So if a little's good, more is better, right? right? If I give you 1,000 milligrams of testosterone, 2,000 must be really good. Well, here's what happens if we overshoot. Acne and hair loss. Well, we, the hair loss seems to be a problem one way or another, right? If you don't have enough testosterone, you're losing your hair. And if you have too much testosterone, you're losing your hair. So you can't win on the hair piece, right? You got to get it right in the middle. You end up getting man boobs. That's not cool. You have an increased risk of heart disease. So when you use testosterone replacement therapy, Patients generally have a lower risk of cardiovascular disease, but if we over-replace you, your risk goes up. And you have a decrease in your sperm production. So it's paramount that when you get testosterone replacement therapy, you follow up and get your laboratory studies. So you'll get checked at four weeks, and then we'll check them again at four weeks, because we need to know exactly where you are at each step of the equation. But remember, the labs are only one piece of it. I, we get your lab report back, and then I call you, or Steph calls you and says, how are you feeling? Combine how are you feeling on the therapy with your laboratory studies, and then we determine what the next step would be for you. But we closely monitor each individual that gets testosterone replacement therapy, and that's why. So sounds kind of good, right? If you're low, you should get this stuff, right? Unless you have a reason not to. But is it safe? Is this like a good thing to do? And testosterone replacement therapy has gotten a lot of bad press. Um, the cardiologists will tell you, you know, don't do this, you'll have a heart attack. And what happened is these studies that were done on it are old. So this just came out of the New England Journal of Medicine in June of 2023. And this is the largest study they've ever done on testosterone replacement therapy. And it's called the Traverse Study. They took 5,300 men and they randomized them into control groups. So half of them got testosterone replacement therapy. The other half got a placebo. So they didn't know what they got. They told them it was testosterone, but half of them didn't. And they followed them for almost three years. And at the end of that, they found that there was no increased risk of prostate cancer, no increased risk of heart attack, no increased risk of a stroke. There was a lower chance that you'd become anemic or have a low blood count. But there was a significant increase in overall sexual activity, symptoms, and desire. So they stopped the study at that point because the results between the two groups were staggering. The folks on testosterone therapy felt a heck of a lot better than those that were not taking the testosterone therapy. So they felt at that point you really shouldn't continue to deny these individuals this for years and years and years to try and get more data. So they stopped the study. So the answer is it's safe. So one of the things I wanted to mention is it's not the only thing. So I mentioned earlier about having an optimal level of testosterone and not over-replacing you. So what if you have an optimal level and you're not quite where you want to be? So if your libido is not quite where it wants to be or you're still having some erectile issues, 
What else can you do? Well, we're not going to give you any more, and you know why. But there are other things we can use. We can use supplements, supplements that increase your nitric oxide. And these are over-the-counter supplements and supplements we have, where you take a couple tablets, and they help dilate the blood vessels a little bit. We have peptides, and I'm going to have Christy tell you, speak to you about peptides and give you a few words of peptide advice, Christy. Christy, what, what's a peptide, Christy? Peptides are composed of anywhere from 2 to 40 amino acids. And what do they do for us? There is a plethora of treatments, uh, various treatments in which peptides can address and promote everything from cognition, weight loss, metabolism, sexual arousal, and um, just overall well-being. So if you have any questions, Christy's card is here. If you ever want to talk to her about peptides, take a look at our website. It'll give you some details. My wife and Christy are really the experts on the peptide section, which is why I didn't comment any more on it. Thanks, Christy. The other thing we have is something called a P-shot that I've started doing. The P-shot stands for Priapus. The P is Priapus. Priapus was the Greek god of fertility. And this was developed for men with erectile dysfunction or Peyronie's disease. Peyronie's disease is an abnormal curvature of the penis. And it uses your body's own platelet-rich plasma. So we draw your blood and spin it down. And then we inject it into the penis. And what it does is it creates more blood vessels and more nerves. Because when you activate platelets, when you cut yourself, Notice you get a big black, first of all, you bleed. Then it eventually stops. And all bleeding eventually stops, right? So you, it stops. The platelets plug up the area around the blood vessels. And then over a period of time, they turn all kinds of nice shades of black and blue and yellow. And then it goes away. But if you look at your veins or on your hand and you cut one of them, you'll find that they heal. And they still look like a vein straight across. So that's because these platelets signal or message that there's a trauma or an injury, and they rebuild the blood vessels. So what we're doing when we do a priapus shot or a pea shot for a man is we're injecting the platelet-rich plasma into the vascular sides of the penis and activating it with a drug called calcium chloride, which is tricking the platelets into thinking there's an injury there, and there is no injury there. So as a result, you start getting more blood vessels, more nerve endings. With more blood vessels comes more blood flow. With more blood flow comes firmer, stronger erections. So P-shots are something that we do as well if folks are having some issues with erectile dysfunction. And it's been great for Peyronie's disease. Folks with Peyronie's disease um, with this abnormal curvature, you actually inject it into the area where the curvature is. But it's so much better if, than the surgery because the surgery for it not to gross you guys out, the surgery for it is you cut the scar tissue, right? So you cut it, straighten everything out. There you go. Back to the flagpole. Every time you operate on someone, no matter what you do to them, whether it's orthopedic surgery, general surgery, plastic surgery, you create scar tissue. It's impossible not to. That's how we heal. So what do you think happens after you cut this thing and you straighten it out? Right. Scar tissue forms again. And if you, there's an opportunity for someone to have a minimally invasive procedure with a needle without having to go through surgery on that part of the body, it's definitely worth doing. They always teach you, in, you know, when you're going to be, become a surgeon, you do the least invasive things first to somebody, right? And in terms of Peyronie's disease, particularly if it was me, I would want to do the least invasive things first. So it works great for Peyronie's disease. So I'll tell you a story. One of, um, one of my best friends from junior high school, we kept in touch. And he is my age, so he's 56. And despite being like brothers from another mother, we never really have much of a conversation about medicine. He works for the NSA, so we talk about Wuhan a lot. So. One day he said to me, you know, I've gained all this weight, I can't get this weight off, I'm tired, da, 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 da. So I said, did you ever have your hormones levels checked, Jeff? And he said, well, yeah. And my, I went to the physician assistant and they said they're normal. I said, well, maybe you should stop by and, you know, we have some things at Burek Center like um, 
semiglutide and terzepatide, some of these things to help you lose weight. And he said, nope, I'm doing it natural. I don't really want chemicals. Because, you know, I believe better living through biochemistry. He does not. So nine months later, I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm hitting the gym five days a week. How much weight did you lose? Nothing. So OK. How about muscle mass? I, and no matter what I do, I work out all the time, and I can't get any bigger. I said, send me your labs. You, you, you need someone to take a look at these. So he sent me his labs, and his testosterone level was like 220. Again, 200, 800, so 220. So I said to him, geez, you, it's, it's real low. He said, well, the, the physician assistant said it's normal. I said, it is, but it's not optimal. Like, you've got all the symptoms of low T here, pal. So I said, let's repeat them. You need to repeat them before I do anything to you. Let's see where you are now, because that was nine months ago. We repeat them, 180. Okay, so. After a conversation of firing his PA, he decided to come up and for the first time in the 50 years I've known this guy, I actually helped, I took care of him. So what I did for him after a discussion of all the options that are available to him, I put some BioT pellets in him, some testosterone pellets. So after that four week period, his girlfriend of many years said, man, you must be doing okay, you must be feeling, feeling something with these. And he said, why? And she said, well, I got up in the morning and the house was clean. And that didn't happen. And then he's been feeling great. He's been doing well. He's following what we need him to do. And I'm not kidding. I got a text from him two nights ago. And the text said, tell Ra from Rachel, tell, tell Adam, thank, thank God for those pellets, was her exact text. So it's really been a life-changing opportunity for him. He is starting to lose a little weight. He is going to show up and actually get some, some semi-glutide. He's given in now. He realizes that hormone therapy and bioidentical hormone therapy, and if you go to a doctor and you do what they tell you to do, sometimes it works. Um, so that's what he's doing. So that's one. Another story, my stories are different than the slides, but another story is a guy that was in his late 50s. And his reason for looking at testosterone replacement therapy was low libido, but he wanted more mental clarity. He wanted some sharpness. And this guy is a business owner, and he's pretty sharp to begin with. So we kind of thought to ourselves, hmm, if he gets any sharper here, I'm not sure what's going to happen. So anyway, long story short, I put hormone pellets in him as well, to BioT testosterone pellets. So he calls me one day and said, these pellets must be doing something to my brain. So I said, well, what are you talking about? I said, are you sharper? Yes. OK, that's what you wanted. He said, no, I feel great. But let me tell you, let me tell you what happened to me. He said, I think these things are really affecting my ability to process information. So he went hunting with his son. And his son's in his 20s. And they, they go to the same place every year. But this time, he saw this deer. And the deer was through the trees. But up over in that area, there was a clearing. And he said, before you, before you put these pellets in me, I would have been, eh, I don't have a shot at this thing. But this time I said, wait a minute. I can get over there to get a clear shot at this thing. So he runs with his gun at full speed to try and get to a point where the field clears. So he has a shot at this deer. And he said to me, I would never have done this before. So what do you think happened? No, I didn't get shot. He's still alive. So he's running with this gun after this deer, and he doesn't realize he goes off the trail and sprains his ankle. So now he's coming home in a, in a boot. And he said to me, these things have turned my mind into a 25-year-old's mind. My body's still 58. And he said it happened once during this, this particular hunting trip, and it happened a second time with him during this hunting trip. So he was convinced that it took his, it took his, bo his body was feeling so good, his mind was tricked into thinking the fact that he could do these things again when he really, in fact, could not. So very fortunately, he didn't get shot. He did miss the deer, um, and he came home with a boot on his leg. 
So how, I mentioned a couple ways about giving testosterone. So there, there are many ways you can give patients supplemental testosterone or testosterone replacement therapy. Uh, each of them have pros and cons. The first one I, I put up there is injections. So you get a, an injection, it's called IM or intramuscular, so it goes deep in one of your muscles, in your arm or in your backside. You have to do that, generally speaking, twice a week. The testosterone itself is like motor oil, so pulling it up in a syringe has been a, is a little bit of a challenge sometimes. But you give it to yourself twice a week, you have to do it on a regular basis, you have to have needles, and you have to carry it around with you, if you travel. The next is topicals, so you can use creams and gels, and you put the creams and gels on. You need to put them on with a glove, so it doesn't get transmitted into your hand. And then usually you can use the inner thigh or the inner arm, um, and then you need to cover it up pretty quickly. The topicals also can be transmitted to other people. So your significant other, or your dog. Anyone ever sit there and have their dog come up between their legs? Last thing you want to do is give your dog testosterone. I guess if it's a male dog, it'd be a different story compared to a female dog. But it'd be a problem no matter what. So there's a transference issue there. Now the advantage of both of those, there is an advantage to those, you can change the dosages as you need to. So if after a month I decide or you decide that you're not feeling what you need to do, you can have more, have less. You can change them on the fly a little bit more. The third is BioT pellets or bioidentical hormone testosterone pellets, which is what I have. The advantage of those is they go in, a little procedure in the office where you get some numbing medicine in the backside, use the device, you put some of these in there, you're good to go. So they last anywhere from three to six months, depending on your activity levels. You don't have to carry around needles. You don't have to worry about transmission. It's not going to go anywhere. You've got it in your backside and you're done. The downside to bioidentical pellet or hormone pellets is once they're in there, they're in there. So if your levels aren't quite what you need them to be or they're a little too high, we have to use medications to help adjust them. So we calculate your dose based on a myriad of factors, your body weight, your body mass index, your labs, of course, and your age. But that's another form of hormone delivery system is BioT pellets, which we do a lot of. And the other one that just came out a little while ago came out of Mayo Clinic. And this is interesting. It's an intranasal testosterone. So, you know, a couple snorts and, you know, I guess you're good to go. Well, I'll tell you the details on the, the, male, the intranasal. The intranasal needs to be used three times a day. So that's a massive compliance issue, right? I don't know about you, but I'm not carrying around a nasal spray and taking a hit three times a day. I'm going to end up getting drug tested at my own office if they see me doing that all the time. So, um, so that's out. It is available. It's something that people are using. It's, it's, I put it at the bottom for good reason. That's something that I can't imagine any of us wanting to do that three times a day regularly. So I want to leave you with this thought. If you're having any of those symptoms, and you've ever been told by one of your primary care doctors or anybody that you just need to live with it. What do you expect? You're tired. Of course you're tired. You're 60, you're 70, you're whatever. Pick a number. Get tested. It's easy. Steph and Tom will take care of you. There's Tom's information for his email and his cell phone number. We'll send you a lab slip. If, it, if it's normal, amen. You're great. And you're feeling great? Fantastic. But if you're not, come see me because I want to make you feel better. I love what I do. I know I can make you better. And I love making you better. It's the highlight of our day when we have phone calls from people like that or a text message from somebody's wife or girlfriend that says, you know, I got my husband back. It's amazing. So a lot of things we do in medicine, we save people's lives, right? We're in a car crash, ruptured spleen, you save their life. But this gives us an opportunity to take the life that you have, the life that you've been given, and make it better. If you have any questions, let me know. And thank you so much for your time, and I hope you have a great happy hour on Friday afternoon.